title of my sermon today is Jesus, the priest of a higher order. I will, first of all, I would like to thank Ajay uh, for choosing all the songs that are suitable, uh, that are fitting to the uh, topic we are going to study. This is a, a suggested topic from our RCL, our uh, uh, worship calendar. Thank you very much for Ajay for setting up uh, uh, the stage. So we, uh, I, I do believe that by listening to the song, singing the songs itself, you might have already understood what am I going to speak. I, I believe uh, he has done such a fantastic job. Even Manova, he made very appropriate uh, uh, comments as he was speaking. My heart was beating so fast. Manova, are you going to speak my message and preach before I do? <laughs> I was just wondering, please, please don't touch this point. However, uh, once again, I would like to appreciate all our worship team for coming together in coordinating in such a way that entire service goes on one particular theme so that we all may be drenched, uh, get sunk and drunk into the word of God. Okay? Uh, I was just uh, wondering, uh, when I look at worship calendars, there are so many uh, special days in the calendar. We call Christmas, we call Epiphany, we call Easter, Good Friday, <coughs> Pentecost, Ascension, and this is the time in a week or two we will be celebrating Christ the King Sunday. I was just wondering why there is no Christ the Priest Sunday. You know, Christ the King Sunday is that Jesus is the King we all know, but we all know very well for sure from the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, one of the very strong uh, theme that has been woven into every book and every word in the Bible is the theme of priesthood. And why there is no this uh, Christ the Priest Sunday? Uh, but I don't know the answer. But if somebody is listening who are able to influence the calendar, I, I really appreciate if that was uh, added. However, we can meditate uh, on that. Christ, the priest of higher order. Every religion in this world, they have some kinds of priests. Even we all can witness. In our own country, there are so many religions. We have seen that. In, but every religion, it has some kinds of Priest. But the understanding of priests from other religions in comparison to the Bible is, is entirely different. If any other religion gives importance to the priesthood, Bible gives more than that. Bible speaks a lot about priesthood. Bible speaks from Genesis till the revelation about priesthood. As I said, this is a theme that has been woven into each and every word from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation, last verse. Everywhere you will find this theme. And it is such an important theme, understanding of it is so crucial and very important for all of us. And you know what? The church has been in history, the church has been divided on this particular topic. The church has been divided in, the, in which uh, Catholics said uh, priests are specially chosen people. They are there. Worship has to be done through the church. And Protestant says uh, about the universal priesthood. All the believers in the church of Jesus Christ are priests. So on this topic, the church has been divided also. So from which we understand it is so very important. And... Uh, we speak a lot about priesthood, but in these modern days, most of the churches are not able to relate to the priesthood. It is because we have left this uh, so-called liturgical worship. I'm not, uh, see, as I'm making some comments about liturgical worship, I'm not saying we all have to leave this pattern of worship and get back to liturgical worship. That's not my intention. But liturgical worship has some beautiful and theological uh, gospel-related messages which are very important for us to relate and to understand. In these modern days, our worship is like people coming together, gathering and choosing few songs which may touch their hearts and which may be from the scripture. And we'll be singing and ascribing praises to God. And we call it worship. 
But liturgical worship will be a little bit different. If anybody who have come from Catholic background or who have come from the CSI, CNI background, you might have seen how these priests will be walking and how they are turning to the altar and turning to the people and saying the words they say and even the procession the way they do procession. And all these liturgical worship pattern, these are not something, many times people think these are pagan. Many times we think, but it is not. Actually, most of them, they are taken from the scripture only, from the script, biblical understanding of priesthood only, they have taken these methods. So as I said before, I don't, when I said these good comments about liturgical priesthood, I don't mean that we have to switch to liturgical worship. But still, it, is, uh, it will be very easy for us if you are able to relate to that worship so that we will be able to understand what this uh, priesthood is. It is because most of the Christian theology is completely based on the understanding of the priesthood. If we don't understand biblical understanding of priesthood, we won't understand Christian gospel. If we don't understand the biblical understanding of priesthood, we won't understand Christian theology and in fact, we won't be able to understand anything in the Bible. From Genesis till the Revelation, everything is written in the pattern of priesthood and Bible speaks a lot about it and today's scripture is also about priesthood and priesthood of higher order so uh, the scripture itself is self-explanatory but I would like to set some context for us to understand that scripture there are so many symbolisms of priests in the Bible can you please help me to find, uh, can, can you please uh, spell few? you? Any, do you know any priesthood symbolisms you can find in the Bible? Pardon? Order of priesthood, it can be symbolisms. Symbolisms of priesthood. There are certain characters which are chosen to be the prefigures of Jesus Christ also. Um, Melchizedek, we read from this scripture reading today. Then? Aaron, very good. Any other? It is not just a test, just to let us have uh, participation from all of us. That's the only uh, intention. Pardon? Levites, Aaron, uh, Aaron, Levites, Melchizedek. I'm sure you would be having much more. If you just can sit and think, you would be having many more answers. But I would like to bring before you four symbolisms which have been used in the Old Testament. They do prefigure or they explain and they speak about uh, Jesus Christ. Some of them are, uh, 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 you know, uh, archetypical, some of them are antitypical, some are opposite to Jesus, some of them are uh, similar to Jesus. So the four uh, symbolisms of priesthood I would like to take is number one is Adam. Adam has been chosen, Adam has been treated as a prefigure for priest of priest Jesus Christ. And uh, we all know the Bible speaks about Adam and Bible compares Adam with Jesus Christ, especially you will find in Romans chapter 5 verse 12 and where you will see Adam is a type of Christ that was the representative of entire humanity. Whatever happened to Adam, happened to entire humanity. Adam is being our uh, federal head. Adam's federal head, she bringing guilt, corruption and death to humanity. Is, it is completely contrasted with Christ's obedience and substitutionary death that is bringing justification to believers. So Adam is the person who was compared to Jesus Christ. And most of the times we think Adam is just a federal head, that's all. But in reality, in the biblical narrative, in the biblical language of the Old Testament, we understand Adam was more like a priest. God appointed Adam as the priest of the entire creation. You know, in the liturgical worship, if you have seen, uh, when before the service starts, you know, you know what happens? there will be a liturgical procession. So what happens is first altar boys will come and they take uh, the incense and they will be, sorry, first they will take the cross and they will take the cross and go and then they will take incense and then priest would be, uh, sorry, the holy communion elements will be taken and then pastor or the priest will be 
following. This, there is a procession and there is an order and this order has to be kept in that worship. And similarly, if you look at the creation, there is an order in the creation. First the sun and moon, sorry, first the earth and light have come, heavens and earth, then sun, moon, star, fishes, animals, all whatever we have seen, there is an order. At the end comes the priest just as how the altar boys goes and at the end of the altar boys goes the priest at the end comes Adam and Eve who are chosen to be the priests of this entire nation what is the duty of the priest the duty of the priest is nothing but uh, giving the right worship to the Lord R giving right praise to the Lord leading the people into the right place similarly Adam has been chosen to lead the entire creation into the right praise towards the Lord and uh, entire creation can be seen as a macro temple and that is the reason um, uh, sorry entire creation can be seen as a macro temple the Eden guard the garden of Eden was not viewed as simply piece of farmland but as a archetypical to sanctuary and if you read if you have any time please go read the description of tabernacle description of the temple of Sota, which was built by Solomon and all these description will be explaining in the inner sanctuary there will be all sorts of trees animals plants and this creation and God will be in the middle and the priest comes and leads in the worship all the sanctuaries they do have some sort of creation because they considered in theology in a poetical form entire creation as a temple and Adam and Eve have been chosen as the priest to lead the entire creation into worship that is why many aspects of the garden can be found in the sanctuary such uh, such as tabernacles, tabernacles and Jerusalem temple not only that genesis chapter 2 verse 15 can anybody help me what have what is said in genesis 2 15 god created the garden and he put the man in the garden and what did he say take care of it you have to look after this right that's what god said genesis 2 verse 15 in uh, where you will find the word man has to work in the garden okay and man has man has to keep the garden these are the words you will find genesis 2 15. the hebrew words used in this place of these two words is are quite interesting the first word is abad uh, a b a d abad you, you, some of us can uh, uh, relate to the hindi language word ibadat abad ibad you know these all are similarly related words actually Okay, Abad, which means to work and to serve, and this word most of the times translated as to worship. So, first work God had given to Adam was to lead in worship. That is the word Abad. And the next, you'll find this word uh, uh, in Deuteronomy 4, verse 19, uh, and so many other Levit Levit places in the Leviticus, you'll find Adam is using the same word, Abad, uh, which is used for worship. So Adam was chosen to lead worship in the garden. And the next word used in Genesis 2.15 is Shamar, the word for the word to keep. The word Shamar has been used and this word is commonly used to explain about the priestly service in the worship to keep the utensils of the lord to keep the premises of the lord clean every service in the temple of the lord wherever the word keep is there this word shamar has been used which is part of levitical worship so god created adam and he put him in the garden and he told him abad and shamar which means adam you have to lead the worship adam you have to serve the temple here you have to serve and lead worship which is may which makes adam nothing but the priest so adam is a first figure for us to be considered when we talk about priesthood and but unfortunately as as we also read that due to sin adam failed to offer the right worship and adam has become an imperfect priest instead of leading into the right worship he has taken the entire humanity towards 
the wrong worship a worship of self and towards the due to which he led humanity as well as the entire creation towards destruction because adam is a imperfect priest and the second symbolism of priesthood we'll find is jacob and aaron together i'm bringing you know the uh, jacob you'll be wondering why pravin is bringing jacob here jacob he has a wonderful experience in his life which has set the foundation for entire worship in the bible and the entire understanding of uh, the temple the tabernacle you all know the vision jacob had you know uh, we all know the place can anybody help me what is the place bethel bethel is a place bethel means beth means house el means god bethel means house of god as he was going uh, from his father uh, he, he had a vision in the sleep where the angels were going up and down up and down the uh, jacob's ladder usually it is called jacob's ladder where there is an axis between heaven and earth it sets the foundation for the priestly ministry the priest has been chosen to connect the heaven and earth to bring the heaven and earth together in many of my sermons i was speaking how jesus brought the heaven and earth together through his incarnation he brought the divinity and humanity together through his incarnation because jesus is 100% god and 100% man in one person he brought heaven and earth together so the picture for the priestly ministry is bringing the heaven and earth together bringing god and humanity together every priest should be a jacob's ladder we are chosen to be the priest of god and we are called royal priesthood we are to be the uh, jacob's ladder between god and humanity we should the moment people come to us they should be able to relate to god they should be realizing the kind of god we are worshiping that's what scripture says so every priest he should be a jacob's ladder then that is why jesus also look at the connections here which are so beautiful jesus said in john chapter 14 verse 6 and where he said i am the way i am the oh, i am the way the truth and the life and, I, and no one can come to the father except through me jesus is the only way between god and humanity and uh, manova read the scripture also there <coughs> there is only one god and one mediator between god and man that is the man jesus christ he is the mediator in between he is the jacob's ladder between us and god that is what god wanted us to be jesus is and the next person i mentioned here is jacob jesus is the true israel we all read isaiah book of isaiah if you read many places it is written the jacob will be suffering jacob will be brought out of egypt jacob will be redeemed jacob will be my suffering servant jacob will be the king jacob will be leading the nations all these words will be reading many of the times people who try to read it only in textual context they won't be able to understand how these scriptures are relating to jesus when jesus read the book of isaiah he put himself in the place of jacob he put himself in the place of israel he considered entire he is the personification of entire israel soul that sinner shall perish so what did what uh, israel committed sin it shall pay it shall perish so what jesus did i take the place of israel as the federal head so i become the soul that sin and i'll i'll perish i will die and i will rise again from the dead that is how jesus read book of isaiah suffering servant we read but in fact isaiah 53 and all when we read we think it is talking about punishing one person and the next chapter or the previous chapter will feel Jacob will be there Israel will be there Israel is a nation as well as one person so Jesus personified himself completely as a nation of Israel and whatever the nation of Israel has to go in other words whatever the entire humanity have to go through Jesus personified himself and he has taken it upon himself and he died and rose again from the dead that's why apostle Paul says we are being crucified buried and resurrected with jesus christ when jesus body was buried we are crucified we are crucified when he was buried we are buried when he rose again from the dead we rose again from the dead jesus is not just the federal head like adam but he is the personification of entire humanity what jesus is doing in his incarnation he has taken entire flesh into himself 
here and uh, you and me where are we we are in jesus in his incarnation where are you and me we were in adam in his sin and whatever happened to adam happened to us so now whatever happened to jesus happened to us that's what romans chapter 6 verse 1 to 6 says whoever whoever baptized into christ are baptized into his death they are crucified with Christ, buried with Christ and resurrected with Christ. This is the baptismal formula we always use. But what is the main picture we see here? We all being personified in Jesus himself. And Jesus, he as Jacob and as well as, as uh, Aaron, uh, he is bringing the heaven and earth together. He is bringing us and God together. That's what we see. So this is a beautiful picture from the Old Testament we see about uh, the priesthood. And the next character I would like to bring before you is Jonah. You'll be wondering why Pravin is going here and that Jonah, how? Jonah is not even a priest. Jonah was a prophet. Have you forgotten? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember Jonah is not a priest. He is a prophet. But he is also given priestly ministry. And Jesus used the example of Jonah also. Matthew chapter 12 verse uh, uh, 39. Uh, we read uh, when Jesus was asked about the sign. He says, an evil and an adulterous generation ask for a sign. But none will be given, in, given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So the sign of prophet Jonah has been happened in the life of Jesus. So can we consider Jonah as a prefigure to Jesus? Jesus literally in his word said so we can consider Jonah as the prefigure to Jesus Christ. What happened? What, what happened to Jonah? How is he doing his priestly ministry? We all know very well. Children can help me with the story also. What happened? God called Jonah and said Nineveh is full of evil. I am going to my wrath is going to come upon it and it may be destroyed. And I want you, Jonah, to go and speak for me. You go to the people and speak to them, lead them to repentance. And did Jonah do that? No. He was so reluctant to go and obey what God says. And he, he want, God asked him to go to Nineveh. He went to, he was going to Tarshish. And God, understood, God felt, okay, this fellow is not going to listen. Let me bring my big whale and he, it may catch him and put him in in a way so that he can have a free ride. So God provided a free ride for Jonah. So the whale drop, uh, took Jonah and dropped him in. Nineveh. When Jonah went to Nineveh, he understood, okay, he may, God is not going to leave me if I don't do it. So he went and he spoke to all the people there and he went to spoke the king and spoke about uh, the coming wrath of God upon them. And all these people repented. His mission accomplished. Was Jonah happy with that? No, Jonah was not happy. God asked him to... <coughs> To be, to act like a priest to the Nineveh. <coughs> but Jonah got a message. God wants the people of Nineveh to be repented. He went and preached the message. In fact, as he was preaching, I, I feel he doesn't want them to be repented. He truly doesn't want them to be repented. He doesn't want mission to be accomplished. But what to do? God is powerful. Even though he is hesitant to do the mission, it was accomplished by the work of God. All the people repented. So Jonah, what happened? On the set date, he went to the hill and he was sitting under what tree? Pumpkin. <laughs> Pumpkin tree. Oh, we need to call it wine. Uh, he is sitting under the shade and he was looking, oh, how God is going to destroy Nineveh. When God did not destroy, he got so upset. So what happened? What is he doing? He is called to be the priest and he is called to connect the people to God. And he, he, he has to connect uh, sorry, people to God and he has to revive them. What is happening is we can clearly see how hesitant Jonah was to bring these people to God. When God told him also, he was completely against it. He did it uh, without any interest. He was hating it and 
uh, but god has to accomplish his mission uh, we, jonah was like a uh, religious nationalist you might have heard this word very much these days religious nationalist or christian nationalist in especially in america and all will be people will be speaking so much about it these people they want to stand very much for their religion and sometimes and they want to stand for their nation and sometimes what they do their love for the nation becomes their religion their religion become their love for the nation if you are part of if you are if you belong to this particular religion then you are a true nationalist if you don't belong to this religion then you are not truly the nationalist if you are from this religion then you love your nation if you are not from this religion you are anti national you move, we all know we are hearing these words so much, so very much around us okay but in the west also it is the same in so many places also let's look at it the israel and gaza war that is taking place also how many christians are just supporting just for the sake of their religion knowing certain places knowing the kind of atrocities that are taking place i am not supporting any one part one side but what am i trying to say is their support towards a particular group or particular party of people goes it is completely based on their religion and for no other humanitarian or any compassionate or love towards the people just because it is said i believe it and i did it that's all it has no emotions no involvement from the people so no and jona was also a uh, probably we can say israeli nationalist of his time and his nation underwent so much of persecution by uh, these um, uh, assyrians that's why he wants to see okay god i got the opportunity god want to god's anger is upon them okay and god wants me to go and tell the message so i got the opportunity to take my revenge so i will not go and tell and these people will be under god's wrath and god will ultimately destroy them so this is what he thought can any please do that can any please do that but unfortunately are we christian sometimes doing that we may not be doing in big scale we may not be directly going attacking but in some or other way the so called christian nationalism or religious nationalism through which we are trying to do the same we are reluctant to pray for our enemies jesus said love your enemies but we are hating our enemies that's why what is the best thing we can do we stop praying just like jonah says i'm a prophet i'll not tell the message that is what sometimes we do and uh, he so stop doing intercession for them instead of sitting under the tree and interceding for the place <coughs> ninava he is looking for him he brought his drinks probably and his barbecue and was looking uh, when ninava is going to burn so for amusement he was sitting so he stopped doing intercession he failed to be a priest he is a priest hesitant to intercede and if you see all these priests that we have seen adam jacob aaron and jonah all these priests are imperfect they all have committed sin they are imperfect and uh, they are temporary they all died and some of them are hesitant to intercede they don't have any peace they, are, they don't have peace in their heart towards other people like jonah they are hating others so these are the priests kind of figures we find in the old testament but when the new testament is written the author of hebrew does not choose any of these priests but he chooses another priestly figure that is melchizedek let's look at melchizedek and jesus christ and then we can conclude in the bible though adam aaron jonah are the types or shadows of jesus but jesus is the priest according to the order of melchizedek aaron is a big picture right big priest we all know but jesus is not the priest according to the order of aaron okay let me offend you some people by saying this what does it translate to us he translates to us like this there is aaronic priesthood which is completely by the law according to the law and uh, there is another priesthood that is melchizedek the priesthood of melchizedek though volumes was written about the priesthood of aaron jesus did not choose that priesthood for our salvation which tells 
though volumes is written, volumes, great things have been done through this law, but Jesus did not choose that to bring the salvation to the people. But he had chosen other priesthood which is above and greater than the priesthood which comes through law. Maybe in your time you can think about it, you will be able to explore a lot, you will get to learn a lot of things. <coughs> So, Jesus is not a priest according to the order of Aaron, but according to the order of Melchizedek. Regarding Melchizedek here, uh, the description was given in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 to 3. For Melchizedek, the king of Salem, priest of the most high God. As I was reading, I thought once, you know, let me do exposition of this scripture only. Because it used wonderful words actually. We always hear a great man of God, here comes it is said, the great priest, it was said, he is the priest of most high God. He is not a great priest of God. He is the priest of most high God. Okay. And who met Abraham, uh, returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated, his name first being translated as king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God remain a priest continually. His name itself, it says Melchizedek, the word Zadok. You heard the word Jehovah Sidakenu, Zadok Sidakenu. What is Jehovah Zidak Sidakenu means? The Lord is my righteousness. The Lord is my righteousness. Zadok, the word meaning, meaning of the word Zadok means righteous. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And Jesus, he is being the priest according to this order. The quality of Melchizedek is being the priest of righteousness. Jesus being the priest of righteousness unto all of us. Jesus himself is your and my righteousness he is not just giving us righteousness but he himself is our righteousness because he is in the order of melki zedek he is the priest of righteousness unlike adam and like jacob and like aaron and like jonah all these people are people of sin all people uh, they require a sacrifice for themselves for their cleansing first and but for Jesus, he is the God, sorry, he is the priest of righteousness who do not require any sacrifice for himself. And uh, next thing we will find in the Hebrews chapter 7 verse 26. It said, for such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and has become higher than the heavens who does not need daily uh, as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's for this he did once for all when he offered up himself for the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever so, unlike Adam, Jacob, Aaron, Jonah, he is the perfect priest. He doesn't have any sin. He has the qualities. These qualities have been already said. He is holy. He is harmless. He is undefiled. He is separate from all the sinners. And he is higher than the heavens itself. Such a great high priest. Such a holy high priest we are having. And he is a priest not by birth, by an oath. You know, anyone, uh, how people will be appointed as high priest? The first thing is they have to be born in the tribe of Levi. Levi. And then not just Levi, they have to be born in the line of Aaron. Not only in the line of Aaron, they have to come in the line of, uh, uh, there is a priest called Zadok. Zadok is a priest during the David's time. Okay, So he has to be in the line of Aaron, uh, sorry, Levi's, and then uh, Aaron. And then he has to come in the line of Zadok. In that line, people who ever come, they only can be chosen as priests. These people, they get it by 
inheritance by birth they will get the opportunity to become priests just like monarchy how uh, some crazy people will get opportunity to become kings and they will torture the nations just like this monarchy these priests also get opportunity to become the priest but Jesus is not a priest like that he did not get this priesthood by his birth but he got this priesthood by an oath why am I saying this word? It is because Jonah was going in my mind so much. Uh, because uh, Jonah, he is not bothered about the people and the priesthood he was called for. The people who got this by birth, they are not bothered. Book of Isaiah speaks a lot about the corrupt priests. They are not at all bothered about people. They are bothered about only the meat they get. We all know the children of Samuel, children of Eli, right? Who are the children of all the, what did these people do? They are not bothered about the worship, they are bothered about the meat that comes into the temple. So before offering to the Lord itself, they were eating those meat. Why? It is because they don't have any concern for the priesthood because they, are, they became priests. Muft mein mil gaya unko. Right? That's why they are not concerned. But Jesus is not like that. Jonah also, he got it freely, that's why. He is not at all concerned about the people. But Jesus, he is a priest not by birth. He is a priest by an oath. When do we take oath? We take oath when we have a great passion towards something. So Jesus is a uh, priest of passion. His priesthood is not a duty for him. For Aaron and others, the priesthood is a duty. But for Jesus, it is not a duty. It is a passion for him. So he is the passionate priest and he took an oath to be the savior. He took an oath to bring God and humanity together. So he is a passion driven, his passion and completely driven by love. So Jesus is a passionate priest. And then Hebrews 7 verse 1 to 3 also it says, For this Melchizedek, he is the king of Salem. Salim, you you know any resemblance you feel? The word Salim, Shalom, which means peace. We say Salam, all it means peace be with you, right? He is the God. He is a priest of peace. He is someone you know. He came from the region of Salem. King of Salem is written, which means he is king of the place called Salem. Probably this is Jerusalem. Can you hear? Jerusalem. So Melchizedek is probably from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is talking about the peace, the kind of city of peace. Well, that is not the uh, situation today, but Jerusalem is supposed to be the city of peace. And he is from that. He is king of peace. And he came into our world to give peace to us. He is the king of, uh, sorry, priest of peace, unlike Jonah, who is priest of peace destruction and who is the priest who hates enemies though being in the place of priest. Jonah was not a priest of peace but Jesus was chosen as the priest of uh, peace. That is the reason as he was being crucified we all know the prayer Jesus made very well and which is very famous. What did he say? Father forgive them for they know not what they do. He prayed for the people who were torturing him. And he prayed for their peace and for their salvation. Such a great high priest we are having. So he is a priest of peace and who intercedes for us always. And it is written, um, yeah, verse 3. Without father and without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of the days nor end of life but made like the son of God remains priest continually he is going to be a priest forever so he is someone who is going to intercede for us unlike Jonah but he is going to intercede persistently and continually forever such a high priest we are having Jesus is the new high priest that we all got so if you read Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 to 28 we come across three things number one the priest Jesus is the perfect priest he is harmless holy we have read he is the perfect priest and he is a persistent priest continually he will be 
praying. He doesn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an end. Continually he'll be doing. He's a peaceful priest. He always brings peace to the people. And he's a, uh, yeah, he's the uh, uh, perfect priest, uh, peaceful priest, and he's a permanent priest. He doesn't have a beginning and he doesn't have an ending. This is the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Having said all this, let me come to the cherry, of the cherry on the cake. Why are we talking so much about this priesthood? Why do I need to know? Why I need to know about all this priesthood? Have you ever thought about it? Maybe to understand, let me ask you a few questions personally. Uh, uh, you know, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, let me explain a few words. A few, let me ask a few questions. I just led us in such a wonderful worship with the team, which was so beautiful. I was also emotionally moved. Are you sure your worship was accepted by God? Are you sure? Did you worship with all your heart, mind and soul? Did the singer sing? Frame is laughing. <laughs> with all your heart, mind and soul. I'm also there. Are you sure your worship is accepted? Are you sure your pray prayers are heard? And they will be answered? We are doing all these. Are you sure? Does God like this worship? At the end we say, Every, may, Lord, may everything that we do bring glory to your name. We say that, but does, really it bring, does it really bring glory to God? Does God really appreciate our worship? Does God really appreciate our prayers? Does God really appreciate our singing? That is why we need to know about this priesthood. Does God appreciate our praise and worship and prayers? The answer is this. We are not praising God directly. Jesus is already praying for us. Jesus is already doing worship on our behalf. And what we are doing is we are joining our voice with him. Because Jesus is the perfect, peaceful, permanent, and <coughs> persistent interceding priest, your and my prayers are going to be answered and heard. It's not because how emotionally you and I prayed, how biblically you and I prayed. Somebody said, are you lifting up the word and praying? I don't think if I just quote the scripture and pray, my prayers would be answered. In that case, devil knows much better than I do. Your, does your prayers will be answered? By ourselves? We don't know. But we have all the confidence we can say. Because we have these kind of high priest who is already interceding for us. We are joining him. Our prayers would be definitely heard. Does our worship in scripture says, we, we don't even know how to pray. Have you ever been in the place? I had been in the place where I didn't know how to pray. God, I don't know what to pray. What shall I do? I don't have any words to say. Sometimes I'm, I ran short of my emotions also. I don't have what to pray. And that is where he comes. And the scripture says, the spirit intercedes for us with groanings. We don't have the words. And those are the times we all can be completely be confident that our prayers are heard because we have this priest who is persistently praying for us. And our worship is accepted. We don't know. I'm, I'm singing here, but millions of thoughts will be going in my head. Our singing is accepted. Scripture says, love you, worship the Lord with all your heart, mind and soul. Are we really doing? If I'm not, uh, please don't take it in negative sense. I'm not saying. I'm able to stand, but I'm just sitting and I'm singing. That means, am I worshipping the Lord with all my strength? 
I'm not talking about people who have inf infirmities and the difficulty to understand. Please don't misunderstand. Uh, all the capacity we have. Okay. We have, we have want to focus on the Lord. Can, could we sing at least one song without distraction? Very difficult for us. Can our worship be accepted? Yes. The confidence is because of this priest. Who is, con he is perfect. We are distracted. But he is always perfect. Adam failed. Jesus did not fail. He didn't fail. He doesn't fail. And because of him, you and I will not be pray failed. Our prayers will not be failed. It is because of Jesus' perfect priesthood. We are doing so many sins. We have been forgiven, but continually we are doing sin. Sometimes sitting in the sanctuary, sometimes standing at pulpit also we may do sin. Can we be accepted and saved? Where do we have the confidence? Only one thing. Because we have these uh, permanent priests who won't change on his word. He always stands for us and he intercedes for us. Our salvation is secured. Our worship is heard because of this priest. Our prayers are heard because of this priest. Our, 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 you know, every, our life is accepted because of this priest. One last thought I would like to share and would like to complete. Many a times we Christians, we, spoke, we speak so much about finished work of Jesus, finished work of Jesus. How many of you believe that Jesus finished everything? Did Jesus finish everything? Huh? He said on the cross, it is finished. Did Jesus finish everything? Let me tell you, Jesus finished something. He still has a lot of unfinished business. And that is what we are talking about now. He finished atonement that is required for entire humanity. On the cross he did. And he is doing his priestly business now. His priestly work, which is unfinished work. He's, uh, as a savior, he finished his work as a, to do atonement on the cross. As a priest, he's continuing his ministry. His ministry is not finished yet. And that ministry we are talking about. And many a times we talk about first ministry and we completely forget and start, uh, stop thinking about unfinished ministry of Jesus Christ. That is the priestly ministry. If we remove these any of these two, both finished work and unfinished work, we don't have a Christianity. We don't have any hope. We speak so much about finished work of Jesus and unfinished finished work of Jesus brought forgiveness and salvation for us. Unfinished work of Jesus brings life into us. The death of Jesus brought life to us. And how much more shall we be saved by his resurrection? Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 5. So, we have a priest like this and he is continually in the business. He is working. And he is continually in the business of imparting life in all of us through his priestly ministry. And he did not say it is finished yet. In Gospels, you will find the word, it is finished. You know, again, there is another place you will, you will hear the word, it is finished. Do you know where you will find? You will find in book of Revelation. In book of Revelation, you will find Jesus says again, it is finished. His priestly ministry is still at work. And he is perfect priest, permanent priest, persistently interceding priest. He is a peaceful priest because of that. We can be confident about his priest. Uh, so our worship would be accepted. Our prayers will be heard. Our heart will be heard. And his impartation will take place. Because we have a high priest like Jesus Christ. May God bless you.